Matthew chapter 13 is a chapter full of parables. We left off about verse 34. He's already given the parable of the sower. He's given an explanation for that. He's given the parable of the wheat and the tares. He will give an explanation to that. He's given the parable of the mustard seed and the parable of leaven. He's trying to describe the kingdom of heaven, its influence, and how that it spreads throughout the world. And he's talking about how the teaching of God's word is the seed and it causes God's kingdom to grow. And one thing I failed to mention as we were talking about the parable of the sower is that sometimes seed that's planted in a person's heart when they're taught the gospel, it may not germinate for years. It could be years before a person actually obeys the gospel. Now we hope and pray that that person's granted time. But there are some people who have heard the gospel in their teens and they don't become a Christian until they're 30, 40, or 50 years old. But that seed was planted back when they were young. And so we, we just hope and pray that as we spread the seed, that even though we don't see immediate results like we would like to see, years later that seed will germinate in a person's heart when their heart becomes receptive and their heart becomes good soil. God gives the increase. That's very good. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, the Apostle Paul talks about that, how that God is the one who gives the increase. One plants and other waters. It's God who gives the increase. And so what we're going to do in October is we're going to do a lot of seed sowing. And we will see God give the increase. We're going to sow the seed in Roy City. And we might see immediate results that weekend, and we may not see anything for two or three months. We may not see anything for two or three years in some people. But the seed will be sown. And that is God's will that we just do that. The power is in the Word. The power is in the seed, not in ourself. And we should not get in the way of, of God's Word in any way, shape, or form. Verse 34, All these things Jesus spoke to the crowds in parables, and He did not speak to them, Without a parable. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables and will utter things hidden since the foundation of the world. So he's teaching them in parables. That's a quotation from Psalm 78 and verse 2. That was a prophecy about how the Christ would teach. And he taught in parables. And as we said before, the, the way of teaching in parables helps the message to be uh, stuck in the memory, to stick in the mind, to, to better be in uh, the memory, and also because this was a culture that was based upon oral teaching. Uh, they didn't have a copy of, of God's Word like we do. I mean, pretty much every household in America can have a copy of God's Word, sometimes two or three. So things were depending upon uh, oral teaching, and so teaching in parables was an easy way to, to teach God's Word, and it stuck in people's minds. Now, verses 36 through 43, Jesus gives an explanation to the parable of the wheat and tares. He did not always give an explanation, or it's not always recorded in the gospel accounts an explanation to his parables. But he gives an explanation to the parable of the sower, and he also gives an explanation here to the parable of the wheat and tares. Verse 36. When he left the crowds, he went into the house, and his disciples came to him, came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the tares in the field. Now, let's go back and read verses 24 through 30 so we can understand this parable. Then we'll see Jesus' explanation of it. Look at verse 24. Jesus presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. 
as we explained last week, tares is a plant that's also called darnel. And it is a plant that bears a striking resemblance to wheat when it's young. But then when it grows and it matures, you can see the difference in the wheat and the darnel or the tares. Verse 26, but when the wheat sprouted and bore grain, then the tares became evident also. So when it matured, the plants matured, you can tell then the difference. Here's a wheat and here is uh, darnel or tares. Verse 27, the slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Do you want us to then go and gather them up? But he said, No, for while you are gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them. Verse 30, Allow both to grow together until the harvest, and in the time of the harvest I will say to the reapers, First gather up the tares and bind them in bundles to be burned and to burn them up, but gather the wheat into my barn. Okay, let's read the explanation to this parable. They're asking him, verse 36, explain to us the parable of the tares in the field. He said to them, the one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. Well, that's Christ. He's sowing the good seed. He's spreading the gospel message, the truth. Verse 38, the field is the world. Simple enough. And as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom. The tares are the sons of the evil one. So you have the sons of the kingdom, and you have the sons of the evil one. The evil one, of course, would be Satan. Verse 39, And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. And the harvest is the end of the world, or age. And the reapers are angels. So here we have an explanation to what these things, these symbols mean in the parable. The good seed, the one who sows that good seed, the person doing that is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the sons of the kingdom, the disciples. The tares or the darnels are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who does this is the devil. And the harvest time would be the end of the age or the end of the world the time when Christ returns. And the reapers in the harvest are the angels. Verse 40. So just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of the age or the end of the world. The Son of Man will send forth His angels and they will gather out of His kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness and will throw them into the furnace of fire in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has an ears to hear, let him hear. So he's basically talking about how that together in the world you have a commingling of good people, sons of righteousness, sons of the kingdom, and those who are of the devil. And they co-mingle together. Live together. And not only this parable, but the parable of the dragnet that we will see later on in chapter 13, will talk about a separation of those who are saved from the wicked at the end of time. In the world, we co-mingle together. We live together. Some of them may even look like Christians until their fruit sprouts. Just like the tares or the darnel, when it is juvenile, when it is a young plant, looks like the wheat until it sprouts. And you can see the difference. You can tell the difference. And so at the end of time, there will be a great harvest. The angels will, of course, be involved. We're told in Second Thessalonians that angels will accompany Christ when He returns. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, 
verses 7 through 9, Paul says, Give comfort to those who afflict uh, uh, you, when our Lord Jesus Christ will be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire. Keep in mind that fire. He will deal out, verse 8, first, or excuse me, 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 8. He will deal out retribution to those who do not know God and who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These will uh, undergo eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. In verse 10, the saints will be glorified in that day. So that too is talking about the day of separation, the day of harvest, the end of time. The angels will be sent forth when Christ returns. There will be a judgment and then there will be a separation and the angels will be involved in that. Verse 40 says, Just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so it will be at the end of the age or the end of time. The Son of Man will send forth His angels and they will gather out of His kingdom all stumbling blocks or all things that cause to sin. And those who commit lawlessness, what will happen to them? Verse 42. They will be thrown into the furnace of fire in a place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's talking about hell. The Greek word Gehenna. A place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Those who commit lawlessness. That word lawlessness means they're lawbreakers. Lawbreakers. Isn't it interesting that those who are in the church who are seeking to change the Lord's church are trying to say there is no law that we're under? Is that the work of the devil or the work of God? To say that we're not under law, that we can pretty much worship however we want to worship and do whatever we want to do? Lawlessness. That's not of God. That's certainly of the what Jesus calls the, the evil one, uh, the devil. Anyone who would cause someone to to break God's law, they are going to be in trouble on the day of judgment. And just as you would gather, as you harvest uh, your field, you would want to get the darnel or the the uh, tares, and you would bundle them up. They're useless. You can't use that. You throw them in the fire. You burn them. But that which is wheat, you gather that into the barn. So the barn there in verse 30 in the parable represents heaven. Our being with God, the resurrection, and all the, the peace and the happiness and the joy and the comfort that comes with being with God in, uh, for all eternity in heaven. But the, those who are not saved, those who are not in a right relationship with God, they will be lost. And it says in verse 42, they will be thrown into a furnace of fire in a place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This phrase occurs six times in Matthew's account, Matthew chapter 8 and verse 12, here in Matthew 13 and verse 50, Matthew 22 and verse 13, Matthew 24 and verse 51, and Matthew 25 and verse 30, weeping and gnashing of teeth. That denotes intense pain, anguish, sorrow, and agony. He's going to say it again uh, later on in chapter 13 when he talks about another parable that denotes separation at the end of time. Probably all of us saw with horror the images of that burnt bus. The charred bus perhaps uh, in the newspaper, perhaps on the news, and those 24 poor people that, that died in that situation Burned to death, the exploding uh, oxygen tanks. What horror. I mean, that is just beyond comprehension what they must have suffered before they died. But imagine that never ending. The burning. The pain. The suffering. And it goes on and on and on. And it will never, ever end. 
the weeping, the gnashing of teeth. Remember Luke chapter 16? What did the rich man want from Lazarus? He was in such torment in that flame, he just wanted a small drop of water on his tongue to alleviate just a little bit of his suffering. And it wasn't granted to him. We need to really look at what the Bible says about eternal punishment. And to do what it takes to 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 fear God and to, to do what's right and, and to be the wheat. Be the be what God uh, Christ describes here as the sons of the kingdom and to help those who are, are going astray and to help those who, who don't take spiritual things seriously. Uh, help them understand their eternal destiny. And what's really sobering about this is, and when you think about it, it, it it'll make you tremble. I deserve to go there. Because of what I've done. And so do you. That, that is the destiny that each person that has been saved by God's grace and mercy. That was our destiny. A terrible place. But yet look at the righteous. Verse 43. After the harvest, the righteous will shine forth as the sun. In the kingdom of their father. He who has ears. Let him hear. Is In some Bibles. It may be footnoted. That verse 43. Might be referencing back to Daniel chapter 12. Where Daniel speaks of a resurrection. Daniel chapter 12. <clears throat> verse 2 and 3. Daniel looks forward and looks forward to a time of a resurrection. He says, Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but to others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Contempt, contempt if I could speak, or condemnation. Verse 3, Those who have insights or who are wise will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever, will shine forth. That's talking about the resurrected body. It will shine forth. It will be like Christ's body. His resurrected body. That's the, that's the glory of being gathered into the barn. The barn there symbolically referring to heaven. Being saved. And that is what those who remain faithful, who hang in there no matter what, have to look forward to. Shine forth like the sun. And you know in this life, we, our bodies are, uh, we could not say they're glorious at best. And, and as, as we, if we live to an old age, we, we break down. I mean, that's just true. I mean, that's just part of growing old. And, and 1 Corinthians 15 talks about we're sown in dishonor. We're raised in honor. We're, we're sown mortal. We're raised immortal. So it's the concept of, of the glorious, immortal, resurrected body and the fact of being in the kingdom of the Father where there is no more pain, no more suffering, no more heartache, no more disappointment, no more hurricanes, no more problems. All the former things have passed away in heaven. But that's only for the saved. So what he's, what he's talking about here is a separation. We commingle in this life. We live together with the, with the, those who are not the people of God. We live together with them, but one day there's going to be a separation. There's going to be a separation. And the saved will go to heaven, and the lost will go to hell. And that's basically what he's talking about. Any comment or question on that? Look at verse 44. Another parable. 
In verse 44, he gives the parable. And in verses 44 through 46, he's going to give two parables. And he's going to show the value of the kingdom, how valuable it is. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a hidden treasure in the field, which a man found and hid again uh, from joy over it. He goes and sells all that he has to buy that field. So verse 44 denotes a person who, who uh, is somehow digging in a field and comes across this field. He doesn't own the field and he discovers a treasure. Oftentimes in the ancient world and in recent history, people would, would bury things. How many people know about during the Depression, things of that nature? They would take money and they would bury them in the backyard, under the tree, or hide it somewhere in the house because they didn't trust the banks. And uh, in, ancient, in the ancient world, they would have a treasure and they would have valuables and they would take it and they would dig a hole and they would bury it in a field. And here's a man that comes across that treasure. He finds it and he hides it again, covers it, whatever he does to hide it, and he sells everything he has to purchase that field because, because he knows if he purchases that field and owns that field, he has what's ever in that field and that treasure is in that field. And notice that. Wholesale sellout there in verse 44. A total sellout for the kingdom. That shows how valuable the kingdom is and how committed this person is to it that he's willing to sell all that he has, renounce and denounce everything that is number one on that priority list that we talk about and say, this is top priority. This is number one. So this is a, denoting verse 44, a person who is not looking for the kingdom, but finds it. They're not looking for a treasure, this person, uh, in this uh, field. He comes across this treasure in the field and he comes across it and then he sees the value of it and then sells all that he has so he can purchase the field and have that treasure. It's worth that much to him. But he kind of stumbles across it. Verse 45 and 46 denotes a person who's looking for it. Looking for it. As he gives the parable of the costly pearl. <coughs> Excuse me. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. So here's a person looking. They're searching for it. And he finds that one pearl of great value. That's what he's trying to get across. The great value of the kingdom. The great value of the church. And finding that one pearl, he sold all. There's that key word again. It's found in verse 44. Sells all. He sold all that he had and bought it. Willing to give up everything to have that pearl. Willing to give up everything to have that field because there was a value there that was beyond anything he had. What does that tell us about the kingdom? The value it should have in our, in our life. And the value of spiritual things, willing to give up all so that we might have it. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, you offer yourself as a living sacrifice to God. Giving your all, a living sacrifice to God to be a part of that kingdom and to, to, know, to know all the blessings that are in it and to uh, live in that kingdom. Verses 40, 47 through 51, he talks about a dragnet, the parable of the dragnet. Now, this is another parable about separation at the end of time. He says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet cast into the sea and gathering fish of every kind. That's how the fishermen then would, uh, you know, fish. They would put a dragnet in, drag, and you would get all, everything uh, that is caught in that net. And notice again, all of these parables are things that the people were very familiar with. They were very familiar with um, a, a, an enemy coming and, and sowing tares in a field. They were very familiar with a person finding a hidden treasure in a field and then buying that field. 
And again, they were very familiar with uh, someone uh, seeking out uh, good pearls or costly pearls. This was something that they saw on a daily basis. Most of the apostles' uh, occupation were fishermen. They knew what it was like to cast a, a net into the sea and, and to get fish. And you, you gather all these fish of every kind, verse 48. And when it was filled, he drew it up on the beach. They sat down and gathered the fish into containers, but the bad they threw away, verse 49. So it will be at the end of the age or the end of the world. The angels will come forth and take out, of, take out the wicked from among the righteous and will throw them into the furnace of fire in the place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Here again, he emphasizes that place, place of punishment. Christ talked more about hell than any person in the Bible. Even though he didn't always use the word Gehenna, he is definitely describing a place of eternal punishment. And he's talking here about this <clears throat> place of uh, separation and how that at the end of time there will be a separation even though they're, they are all together. We're all together in this world, but in the end of time there will be a great separation, the saved from the unsaved. And that's basically how God views the world the saved and the unsaved. And that's really how we should view it. It doesn't matter the color of the skin, what language they, they speak, or what country they're from, saved or unsaved. That's basically it. And sometimes there's co-mingling together, and sometimes there might be assembling together in the church. But one day there will be a separation. He says in verse 51, have you understanding of all these things? He's asking them, and they said to him, yes. So really, when you look at the context, verses 36 through 51, it seems like he's explaining these things to his disciples. They went into the house, and his disciples came, and they said, explain these things. So he explained the parable of the, the wheat and the tares, and he goes on to explain to them other things like the hidden treasure, the costly pearl, and the dragnet. So it's a further explanation. Look at verse 52. Jesus said to them, Therefore, every scribe who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven is like a head of a household who brings out of his treasure things new and old. Now what's he saying there in verse 52? I puzzled on this for a while. Every scribe who becomes a disciple of the kingdom of heaven. Okay, here's a person who is going to follow Christ. They're going to be in the kingdom of heaven. It's like the head of a household who brings out of his treasure both things old and new. From the explanations I have read and study in this verse, it seems to be talking about how that the person who's in the, in the kingdom of heaven, a disciple of the kingdom of heaven, is someone who brings together old and new things. There are certain truths that are from the foundation of the world true, both in the patriarchal, the Mosaic, and the Christian ages. And the person who is a disciple of the kingdom of heaven brings all these things together, all these teachings together, like a scribe would. A scribe was someone who copied the law. And so a scribe who was someone who was very familiar with the old law would bring together the teachings of the Old Testament and bring them together with the teachings that Jesus were, were teaching, was teaching. As far as bringing them together and seeing the harmony. <coughs> the harmony in the teaching of the Old Testament and the teaching of the New. Didn't we just look at Daniel chapter 12 where it talks about a resurrection? Well, you bring that together with what Jesus is talking about here about the end of time. You bring together out of the treasure things new and old. Now, I believe that's an explanation of that verse. <clears throat> Excuse me, i got some allergy things going on here. Verses 53 through 58. <clears throat> When Jesus had finished these parables, he departed from there, verse 54, and he came to his hometown. 
Where would that be? Nazareth. He came to Nazareth. If you see up here on the map, Nazareth is right about there. That is where Jesus grew up. Jerusalem is down here. There is Nazareth, the Sea of Galilee right there, also called the Sea of Tiberias. So that is where Jesus grew up in that area there in that small town. You remember, remember what Nathaniel said about Nazareth in John chapter 1? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? It was not a very prominent town. It was not very impressive. Uh, didn't have a great reputation. But the very Son of God grew up there. The greatest man who ever lived grew up there. And he goes back to his own hometown in verse 54 and began teaching them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, Where did this man get his wisdom and these miraculous powers? Where did he get these things? Where did he get this wisdom? Verse 55. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers James, Joseph, and Simon, and Judas? Now this isn't the Judas that betrayed him. This is uh, Jude, actually. Verse 56. And his sisters, are they not all with us? Where did this man get all these things? So he goes back to his hometown of Nazareth and he's teaching there. And they're amazed at what he's, he's doing. He grew up in an ordinary fashion, but he was certainly an extraordinary person. But from humble circumstances, being in a, in a poor family, and they're all familiar with their family. You know how small towns are. You, everyone knows everyone. And, and that's exactly what they're saying here. This is the carpenter's son. And we know his mother, verse 55, and his brother, James, Joseph, Simon and Judas. This Judas is Jude. He would be the one that write that small little book before Revelation. Jude. And James is the one who wrote the book of James. At this time, we studied this before, they were not really convinced that Jesus was who he claimed to be. They didn't believe in him. And uh, we're not told of how... Uh, uh, what happened with Joseph as far as his, his earthly father. Some have believed, uh, believed that Joseph, because he's not mentioned here, the, the son of Joseph is there, James, Joseph, Simon, and, and Judas, that Joseph, the earthly father of Christ, might have died at this point or before this point. And so only Mary and Mary's sons and his sisters are mentioned here. So Mary had... Four sons and at least two daughters, perhaps more, because it says sisters. At least two. So there is, uh, what is that, four, five, six, six plus children that Mary had after Jesus was born. Mary did not remain a virgin after the birth of Christ. Here is the proof here in the Scripture. Now, I know in Catholicism she is called the Virgin Mary. But if you take seriously what the Bible says, it plainly teaches that she had other children. Joseph did not know her intimately until after Jesus was born. Then after that, they had these children. At least six Perhaps even more, because we don't know how many daughters. It just says his sisters. And so verse 55 and 56, they're saying, this, this is the carpenter's son. This, is, this person is just an av what we would say an average person of Nazareth. Where did he get these powers? Where did he get this wisdom? And verse 57, they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown. And in his own household. Notice that. That word household means family. Christ was rejected in his own hometown. And in his own household. His own family. Remember what it says in John chapter 1. 
He was, he came unto his own. His own received him not. Not only his own creation, not only his own fellow countrymen, not only his own hometown, but his own family for the most part. Now later on, at least James and Jude would become believers. Uh, Hopefully the rest of them did too as well. Mary uh, believed in him, I believe, all the way to the end. Uh, I'm, I'm convinced of that. But there is just that, that concept of how hard it is to, to, to convince your family, how hard it is to talk to your family, and how that, <coughs> verse 57, it says here, they took offense at him. Well, he was just there teaching the truth. And they were expecting something other than, than what Jesus was. They were expecting a different kind of Messiah. He wasn't what they wanted. Verse 58, And he did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. Notice it doesn't say that he didn't do any. He didn't do many miracles there because of their unbelief. So in chapter 13, you have a chapter of parables, an explanation of parables as Jesus tries to teach what the kingdom is, its influence, its valuableness, how that is something of a value that's worth us giving up everything to have it. And also to show that at the end of time, there's going to be a separation. There's going to be a separation. The righteous will be rewarded in heaven. The unrighteous, the saved, will be lost in eternal punishment. And then Jesus goes back to his own hometown And he says a prophet is uh, not without honor except in his own hometown and in his own household. Isaiah 53 said, as a prophecy, he was despised and rejected of men. And I'm convinced that if we're going to be the church of Christ, that that's going to happen to us to a large extent. If we're going to follow Christ there's going to be persecution that follows when we proclaim the truth. We'll start with uh, Matthew chapter 14 next week, Lord willing.